So welcome to this uh, next lecture in mechanical operations. The last two classes we have been discussing size reduction. In the first class we were looking at some of the principles involved in the energy required for size reduction. In the last class we reviewed some um, industrial size reduction systems, crushers, grinders, fine grinders and so on. So this uh, in this lecture which will conclude our discussion on size reduction we will talk about some aspects of uh, the operation of um, um, size reduction equipment that has a, an effect on the properties of the product. Now obviously in a size reduction equipment the focus is on size. You want to take feed of a certain size distribution and reduce it to product of a smaller size distribution. But there are also other parameters you have to keep in mind. One is shape. Now as we have seen in the early lectures in this course, shape is just as important a parameter for particles as sizes and um, different applications re require different shapes and in a ball mill that, uh, or in any kind of crushing or grinding equipment, the type of particles that you get tend to be polyhedral in nature. They have certain large plane faces, maybe as many as 6 to 7 and they have sharp corners and edges. So their shape is highly crystalline which is okay if your application is such that it, it can accommodate so, such shapes but if you require a more spherical particle then some form of post treatment may be required to change the shape to whatever shape that you desire. The um, other aspect is the structure of the particles. Uh, what you find is that you initially when you do crushing or grinding, the particles that you get tend to have a very crystalline structure. However, if you keep doing it for a long period of time, amorphization sets in. In other words, the particle tends to get more and more amorphous with the passage of time. So if you do not want that to happen, then you have to truncate your size reduction process at the point where the shape starts to change from being essentially crystalline in nature to being amorphous in nature. Shape also has an influence on the separation or classification by size. Now since the uh, size reduction equipment is essentially intended to reduce size, you need to have a classifier situated right next to it. In fact many grinders are operated with an inline classifier. Uh, if you recall a classifier is one that separates particles by size. The simplest classifier we looked at are the sieves which uh, simply separate particles using mesh screens of different sizes that are stacked and typically the output from a ball mill would be taken through a screen in order to do classification by size. And again when you do your lab experiment in ball mill next semester you will use a screen or, or sieve to do the classification of the particles by size. As we have seen before the shape of the particle has an influence on its classification characteristics. The way that a spherical particle would interact with a screen would be very different from the way a non-spherical particle would. So in order to have a good separation by size, a spherical particle is much better suited because you can predict the the screening efficiency for a spherical particle much more easily than you can for a non-spherical particle because you know parameters like angle of approach will start to make a difference when you have highly non-spherical particles whereas with a spherical particle it should not matter as long as the diameter matches the mesh size it will either cap get captured or it will go through. So one of the parameters that are used to describe the operation of a, a ball mill is something called size selectivity. Which is the ratio of the amount of material of size x 
in the core stream to the amount of material of size sacs in feed. So, when you talk about fine and coarse again what we are referring to is a set of screens and if you set one of these as your reference screen then anything that is larger than this would be called the coarse fraction and anything that is smaller than this will be called the fine fraction. Suppose you plot this eta x versus x where x again is the particle size and eta x is the size selectivity parameter. What kind of curve would you expect? Would it look like this? Would it look like this? Would it look like this? 1, 2, 3, 4. Any votes? How many think 1? 2, 3, 4. Yeah, it will kind of look, I mean obviously the amount of material in, in the course will keep increasing as x increases. So, that automatically rules out a couple of these options. Typically, the kind of behavior that you get will look like this, where this is 1 and this is 0. The, the very, very fine sized particles will obviously not be in the core stream. So, their fraction in the core stream will be virtually 0 and then when you go to the very coarse or large particles are very likely to be in the core stream. So, the um, eta x will rapidly approach 1. Now, the point where this is 0.5, the point where this is 0.25 and the point where this is 0.75 are key data points. The point corresponding to 0 0.5 is called the cut size. It is a size at which 50 percent of the material is in the coarse fraction. Uh, X25 is the point, so this is called X50. Or wait, so this is X50, this is X25, and let us say that the 75 fraction, this is X75. X25 point is the point at which 25 percent of the material is in the coarse fraction and X75 is the point at which 75 percent of the material is in the coarse fraction. The ratio X25 to X75 is called the sharpness of cut. And you really want this to be as close to 1 as possible for this to be an ideal operation whereas it is much less than 1 when the, um, the classification uh, or the size selectivity is highly non-ideal. In other words, you want this behavior to look more like you want this to happen in a very sharp way. So, the ideal curve that you want to get is something like this. So, that the x25 and the x75 are very close together and they are clustered right around x50. So, in terms of size selectivity you want a very, very sharp point of demarcation. In other words, you know the purpose of a, of a size reduction equipment is, is twofold. One is to produce product that can be used downstream in your process. But at the same time, a size reduction equipment can also be used as a classifier. In other words, to not only to produce, you know, population of particles to be used downstream, but also to enable us to do the size reduction and then separate the particles by size buckets, so that you can prepare samples of essentially mono dispersed sizes. And uh, depending on how many screens you employ in your setup, you can either simply separate it into one fine fraction and one coarse fraction or you can separate it into several size bins. 
So the, um, the usefulness of a, um, a size reduction equipment is greatly enhanced by the ability to do size analysis. You know, the, since the purpose is to reduce size, it makes sense that you have to be able to measure the size before and after in order for you to assess how well your process is working. So the particle size distribution after size reduction is clearly something that is very crucial to the optimization and, and operational efficiency of the process. So how do you, how do you measure it? That is easy. You know, you just take the output from a ball mill and you run it through a screen or you run it through a sedimentation device or you uh, run it through a particle counter, particle size analyzer, it will give you the size distribution. And similarly, the feed you can measure uh, the same way. So when you look at a typical size reduction operation and you plot the size distribution, let us say that this is your feed in terms of um, you plot dp versus number. After size reduction, you will expect to see that this curve will move to the left, right? As I have mentioned before, what you can really control in a size reduction equipment is this size, the maximum size. And to an extent, you can also control the mean size. What you really do not have control over is the minimum size. The minimum size is difficult to control because you typically device your process in order to achieve a certain maximum size. What you care about is if you are using screens, you want to make sure that the number of particles that are coarser than a particular screen size is limited to a certain number, right? And so the other thing you would see is that this distribution which may have been fairly broad to begin with will typically tend to tighten as you do the size reduction. The reason being that we assume that the initial feed particle size distribution is random in nature, that it has not been produced by design. Whereas this size distribution is something that you are producing by design. And any time you produce a population using a known mechanism, you always get a tighter size distribution compared to the feed. So if I am if I am operating this equipment, what do I want to know? Let us say that I only care about particles that are coarser than a certain size. Let us say that the, this is my x average for the feed is my reference size and I want to know how many particles are larger than this size. I know how many particles are larger than this size in the feed. From this, I want to know how many particles are larger than the same size in the product. That is one metric of size reduction efficiency, right? Clearly, this number should be less. Uh, with size reduction, the number of particles that are larger than a reference size should keep decreasing. And as I said, that is easy to measure. Uh, there are many methods in which you can do this and there is a lot of empirical correlations that have been derived over time for various types of size reduction equipment. There are correlations available that enable you to predict the product size distribution for a given feed size distribution. Once we know what the material is, once, the, once we know what the operating conditions are, you know the type of mill it is, the media that are used in the mill, all those parameters, we can use these empirical correlations to derive the product particle size distribution. But suppose you wanted to model it, suppose you wanted to predict, how would you do that? The, the approach that is used is one that is common to many applications and it is called population balance model 
So what is a population balance model? Anybody knows? How do you write a population, population balance equation? So the, the way that a population balance equation is written in its general form is rate of growth equals rate of birth minus rate of death, right? I mean suppose you are trying to model how the population of India will grow, you will take the, um, that to be the rate of birth minus the rate of death, right? So that is fairly intuitive when you talk about populations in general. How about when you talk about a particle population in a size reduction apparatus? Can you apply the, the same principle and what would be the terms? Well, the first thing you have to remember is total mass is conserved. So if you take a set of particles and size reduce them, the mass now gets redistributed among particles of different sizes. So instead of the mass being concentrated in the larger particles, now the mass will tend to be concentrated in the smaller particles. So there is a redistribution of mass. However, if you look at the total amount of mass, that does not change, right? So that remains constant. So what changes? I mean, what is, what is this growth we talk about? In this particular case, what we are referencing is the increase in number of particles in a particular size range. So in the case of a size reduction equipment, this will refer to delta n in a size range, let us say i to i plus 1 where these are different screens. You have the i screen, the i plus 1 screen and so on. So what we care about is due to the size reduction operation that is happening, actually this will decrease. So if you, if you look at the screens as stacked this way where i is here, i plus 1, i plus 2 and so on, i minus 1, i minus 2, what will grow is this as you do size reduction whereas anything that is above i which is a coarse fraction will actually decrease. So let us say that you want to model delta n of i minus 1. So what would be the terms on the right hand side? What is the rate of birth for this um, segment of the population? Anybody wants to speculate? It is all the particles delta n that are produced by breakage of coarser mid particles, right? to be in that particular size range. When you break a coarser particle, the, it can break down into you know different size ranges. It may break down into this size range or it may break down into this size range. So if you are, if you are only looking at delta n or the growth rate of particles in a particular size range, then you have to also here consider only particles produced by breakage where the end size is in the range of i to i minus 1. Is there a death term? What could it be in this case? So the particles that are already in this size range can get broken down to smaller sizes, right? So that would be your death. So there will be minus delta, minus delta n consumed by breakage. So this would be from i minus 1 to i minus 2, i minus 3 and so on. So the particles that are already in this size channel can break down to smaller sizes and so that represents your depletion term or death term whereas particles that are coarser than the size because of breakage will actually add to the number of particles in the size range of interest. Is that the complete equation or are we missing something? What is the one thing that, had, that can happen in a, in a ball mill that cannot happen in a real population? Agglomeration. Agglomeration, right? You cannot join people together and, and reduce the number that way but agglomeration 
can also produce particles. So, uh, just like delta n can be produced by breakage and consumed by breakage, there are correspondingly consumption and depletion terms associated with agglomeration. So, if again if you look at particles in this particular size range, the particles can slip into this size range by breakage, but they can slip into this size range by agglomeration. Similarly, particles from here can contribute to the size range by breakage, but particles here can contribute to the uh, increase in number of particles by agglomeration. So, a population balance model has to take into account all these dynamics. You have to be able to, in order to estimate the rate of increase of particles in a particular size range, you need to be able to estimate the kinetics of breakage of particle production by breakage and the kinetics of particle size increase by agglomeration. Typically in literature, this uh, agglomeration term is neglected. So, if you look at standard textbooks that deal with uh, population balance modeling of uh, output from ball mills, they kind of tend to neglect the agglomeration part, but you have to realize that there is a very real phenomenon, particularly if you recall our discussion of high energy ball milling where the ball milling can proceed for hours, the tendency for agglomeration is quite severe. And so, you really cannot ignore agglomeration in, in that particular instance, but in general that is a, an important parameter. So, um, again if you, if you read through the textbooks, there is no theory for all this. Nobody can theoretically predict, you know, how this is going to happen, how are particles how many particles in this size range are going to break down to particles in this size range when you expose them to a certain milling condition for a certain period of time. It has to be obtained experimentally. So, the way that the population balance model is developed is what we call a semi empirical method. A, a semi empirical method is somewhere between an empirical method and a theoretical method. A theoretical method would postulate a theory of how this happens will try to solve everything from first principles and try to uh, make a prediction of how the system will behave. On the other hand an empirical approach would simply say we will take data and we do not care why something is happening, we just want to know how it is happening and we will develop correlations based on all this experimental data we gather and we will develop a model based on that. So, that is called the empirical model. The semi empirical model is somewhere between the two it says yes we will collect some data, but then use that data for two purposes. One is as feed into the model to provide some data for unknown variables and secondly to validate the model. So, we try to do it iteratively. You start with some experimental data, feed it into a model, run the model, make some predictions for a different set of conditions, run your experiments under, under the different set of conditions, match the results to the theory. If, if they do not match, tweak the theory again and keep doing this iteratively until your model predictions exactly match your experimental data. And that is the way that simulation of uh, ball mill operation is done. And the population balance model itself, there are two parameters that have been introduced which make the analysis a little easier. One is called the grinding function. and the other is called the breakage function. It is actually the grinding rate function. The grinding rate function represents the rate at which material that is coarser than a given size i breaks down in a given time t. So, the grinding function is always referenced against a reference size i. So, it is a representation of if, you, if this is your reference size and all the material that is coarser is then represented in this u fraction. The grinding rate function is a measure of 
how rapidly all the material that is coarser than that size breaks down. The breakage function relates this to the resulting size distribution. So, this breakage function represents the particle size distribution resulting from breakage. So, the, the particle size distribution function basically varies from a very small value which is let us say that if you look at the breakage function where a particle of initial size i goes to final size i, what do you think that will be? What is the probability that a particle of initial size i after it goes through a size reduction process remains at size i? It is not 0, it is a small but finite value because not every particle in a size reduction equipment will get size reduced because it is not a 100 percent process right. If you have a million particles being processed in a size reduction equipment, 99 percent of them may get size reduced, but there will be 1 percent which just escape every time. So, it is not equal to 0, but it is very, very much smaller than 1. And if you do the summary of the size reduction function for all screens that you have in your process, then this should approximate 1. So, the way the breakage function is defined, the breakage function for a particle staying at the small size is a non-zero but small value. The breakage function if you sum it up over all sizes that are smaller than the initial size, it adds up to 1. So, that is way the breakage function is defined. So, the way that this is related to the population balance is as follows. If you take d x u over d t d t it is given by minus g u times x u. This is one of the standard equations you will see in all textbooks dealing with size reduction. It basically says that the rate of reduction of all coarse mass of all particles that are coarser than a given size is represented by this breakage function uh, sorry the grinding rate function multiplied by the amount of material that is larger than the coarse size than the reference size. So, if I take this expression and relate this to d x i by d t which is the rate of growth that we have indicated here which is the rate of change of the fraction of particles of size x i then um, the corresponding expression would be minus g i times x i. So, this would represent the breakage function for particles that are already at that size. So, that will come with a negative sign because that is a death term plus you will have a summation over all the coarse fractions of g u times x u times this b i u parameter the breakage function parameter. In other words you will take all the contributions of size reduction operations that are converting particles in the coarser fractions to the uh, size range of interest and the parameter that is used here is this breakage function which gives you the, the particle size distribution. The size dis particle size distribution by the way what that means is it gives you data on number of particles in each size range. Okay. So, the breakage function will yield for each of these c sizes. So, you let us say you start with the size i and you are doing size reduction, then it will tell you in the in the size range of i to i minus 1, what is the number of particles i minus 1 to i minus 2, what is the number of particles and so on. So, the breakage function by the way is very much dependent on the design of the mill, design of the size reduction equipment whereas the, the grinding rate function is actually more a function of the material itself. So, the material has a greater influence on the grinding rate function and the equipment design 
has a greater influence on the breakage function. So together they determine for a given set of operating conditions and for a given feed material if you operate your size reduction equipment for a certain time t what is the resulting size distribution and from that you can uh, do this pop, develop this population balance model which again has the growth term, the death term and the birth term and you can solve this either analytically or numerically to obtain the rate of change of particles in a certain in a certain size range. Now when you are doing your classification using a set of screens this is really not a, a differential expression right I mean what you really have is a incremental change you, you have certain steps. So you, actually you can write this as delta xi over delta t so it depends on your classification equipment if you if your classification equipment is capable of detecting size in a continuous range for example a particle size analyzer that uses laser scattering then you would want to keep this as a differential equation and solve it and then analytical solutions may be more appropriate but if your classification equipment is something like a, a screen where with a very well defined mesh sizes for the different uh, sieves then you can approximate it as a difference equation and once you convert a differential equation to a difference equation numerical methods of solution can be applied which you know makes the, pr the problem uh, more computer intensive you know because when you, when you set up a numerical scheme the uh, step size that you use in your simulation has a huge bearing on the time required for executing the program and getting the answer. On the other hand to solve this analytically can be quite difficult because it is not an easily tractable problem because of so many unknowns being there and so the, the choice between an analytical solution to the population balance equation and a numerical solution most of the time people tend to use numerical solutions to uh, solve this. So what you can predict from this obviously is as a function of time of operation you can predict how the number of particles in every size range will grow over time or will decrease over time and you can match that to your experimental data that you are collecting and see how well your model is performing and then change some parameters and so on. Now if you want to include agglomeration into this equation then how do you do that that is when you go back to some of the, the theories that we talked about earlier in this course you have to look at agglomeration kinetics for a given set of particles what is the probability that they will agglomerate and what is the rate at which they will agglomerate and that is again going to depend very much on the nature of the particles, the concentration of the suspension, it is going to depend on the parameters like uh, temperature, in fact what we, what we find is in dry milling the temperature will keep increasing as, as we discussed last time and that can have a significant influence on the uh, cohesion behavior between adjacent particles and that is the reason why in dry milling this is an important term. If you are trying to simulate a dry mill you cannot neglect the um, agglomeration behavior however in a wet mill because the, the liquid itself acts like a buffer between adjacent particles you are more justified in neglecting the agglomeration term in favor of the breakage term and the other reason is when you are using a liquid the temperature rise is also controlled much better. So temperature does not become a, an important effect in determining the cohesive behavior of the particles. So the population balance modeling of the output from a ball mill is a subject that has been well researched there are a lot of papers that deal with it most textbooks contain a chapter on this so certainly I, I will send you some links to some papers that contain a more detailed analysis of how to solve these population balance models using both analytical procedures as well as uh, numerical procedures and you should read through them to get a better understanding of
not just in this particular case, but in general how population balance models are evolved and how they are solved, okay. All right, so we will stop with that as far as discussion on this topic and um, in the next class we will start dealing with another important mechanical operation which is um, storage and transport of solids where again many of the things we have talked about earlier such as adhesion and cohesion play a major role. Any questions? Okay, see you next class.